Hello and welcome to the analysis of the Hindu newspaper dated January 19th, 2023. In this video, we are going to talk about two important newspaper articles. These articles are going to be very important, very significant for the civil services examination. And that is why do watch this video until the end. And let's now start with the first important newspaper article. Now, this particular newspaper article talks about a report which has been presented by Pratham, which is a leading NGO in the field of education right now this particular report has been named as acer it is presented every single year it is annual status of education report right so this report is very important and that is why we are going to study it and why is this article important this is important for the gs paper too that is issues relating to development and management of social sector services relating to health education and human resources right so let's first understand the context of this particular newspaper article and then we will understand what was there in this particular report right so as the schools reopened after nearly two years of closure due to covid 19 student enrollments increased to more than Pre-pandemic levels, but the learning gap widened for foundational skills in learning and arithmetic. Reversing several years of improvement finds the ACER, that is Annual Status of Education Report 2022, which has been released by Pratham, which is basically a non-governmental organization, right? So now, what are the bright spots or the good spots about this particular report? So the first thing is that, the improvement was made on the school enrollment, which has touched a record high of 98.4% in 2022 as compared to 97.2% in 2018. And the proportion of the girls which are aged 11 to 14 who are not enrolled has reduced from 10.3% in 2006 to 4.1% in 2018 to 2% in basically 2022. So this proportion has also decreased, which is a good news. Now the percentage of the children which are aged 11 to 14 enrolled in the government schools has risen from 65% in 2018 to 71.7% in 2022. This may be also due to the fact that People now do not have a lot of money and those who do not have a lot of money basically in get enrolled their children in the government schools, right? This is the particular trend. Now we will not talk about the Delhi government, which is Delhi very different. But in the other areas, in the other areas apart from the metropolis, government schools are there or in the, or all the students who are enrolled in it have some kind of... Uh, have some kind of uh, economic problems and that is why they are studying in the government school but it is a good news for the government because the enrollment rate has increased in the government schools and apart from it a small steady increase in the children's availing private tuitions has been there from 26.4 percent to 30.45 percent between 2018 to 2022 now, there is an improvement in the availability of the smartphones and in 2022, the availability of the smartphones in the homes of enrolled students has nearly doubled from uh, nearly doubled from 2018. Now, the percent of children not going to school has also reduced. It has dropped to 2% or below for the first time in 2022. And even after prolonged school closures during the pandemic period, the proportion of the school children not enrolled in the schools continue to decline between the 2018 and 2022. So these are some of the bright spots or the good areas. Now, there are some areas of concern as well. For example, the, there, we have registered or the this particular report says that there has been a drop in the learning levels of the foundational literacy and numeracy that is fln foundational literacy and numeracy for example in 2022 the basic reading ability of the children in class 3 dipped by 3.8% from 27 point uh, sorry 6.8 percent points from 20 7.2% in 2018 and the proportion of the children in class 3 who could do at least a subtraction fell to 25.9% from 28.2%. This is a very bad news due to the pandemic. This has resulted in this, right? So basically the foundational and literacy numeracy of the children has seen a drop. And 
Now we are going to deduce what has been there in the ASER 2022 reports. So why has the enrollment in the government schools increased? So improvements in infrastructure in the government schools is one of the reasons. Distribution of the textbooks are the reason. The third reason is the midday meals during the lockdown was also the main reason. The fourth reason was the job losses and the closure of budget private schools in the rural areas. If the closure of the private schools is happening, that is leading to people enrolling their children in the government school and that is why it has increased to 71.2% from 65% in 2018. Now, why did the private tuition increase to 31% from the 25%? So, more flexible, it is more flexible to adopt and if a person is unable to pay, they can pay later and provided extra assistance to the children is always a welcome from the from the teach from the parents because they want their parents uh, sorry they want their wards or children to get better education to understand the subjects well and that is why the private tuitions have increased now what are the government is, uh, schemes to promote the fln that is the foundational learning and numeracy in order to increase the fln that is the foundational uh, and learning numeracy foundational learning and numeracy basically we have the national education policy and the, we also have the National Initiative for Proficiency in Reading with Understanding and Numeracy, that is Nipun Bharat. Now, we also have the Foundational Literacy and Numeracy Missions. Now, the effectiveness of all of these programs is questionable because the Foundational Literacy and Numeracy of the children has declined, right? So, these are some of the government schemes to promote FLN, by the way. And now, let's talk about what can be the way forward, what can be the way ahead. So the first thing is that the integration of the Aganwadis and the school systems is very, very important, right? And apart from it, particularly the education component of the Aganwadi system must be adequately funded. At this particular point of time, Aganwadis are seriously underfunded. Their teachers are underfunded. All the Aganwadi workers are underfunded. And that is why the funding of the Aganwadis should also happen at a large scale. These are the basically the two way ahead of for us. Now let's talk about the FLN. Now basically FLN is critical for increasing the country's productivity in terms of human capital. It doesn't matter whether you are just passing the classes, you need to get the better understanding of it, of what is there in the text. And that is where the foundational learning and numeracy becomes very, very important. It is very important for increasing the country's productivity. And as a result, the government's priority should be to raise learning and teaching standards in the country. So this is basically the way forward for us, right? So this is it regarding this particular newspaper article. Let's now head to the next important newspaper article. Now, this particular newspaper article talks about the eco-sensitive zones and in particular, it talks about the state of Kerala and how it is facing the problems regarding the eco-sensitive zones, right? So, let's first understand the context of it. But before that, why is this particular newspaper article important? This particular newspaper article is important for the GS Paper 3 that is Conservation, Environmental Pollution and Degradation, Environmental Impact Assessment, right? So let's first understand the context and then we will understand the eco-sensitive zones and then we will also understand the Kerala's stand on the eco-sensitive zones. Now, this particular article talks about the eco-sensitive zones. Basically, eco-sensitive zones are intended to safeguard protected areas, national parks and the wildlife sanctuaries by transitioning from an area of lower protection to an area of higher protection. But this particular eco-sensitive zone has created uh, a or provoked protest in the Kerala and some other reasons in, and it in, in a precursor to what is likely to emerge in other parts of the country because other part of the country may also face the problems regarding the eco-sensitive zones because the forest cover in the Kerala is very high and that is why the protests are initially in the state of Kerala. Basically, the main problem is that the that uh, that a notification was issued and this particular notification is basically one size fits all solution for everything it isn't very community specific and that is why it sparked a lot of problem right so let's first understand the background of this particular news article right and then we will dive into what is eco sensitive zones and then we will talk about the stand of kerala right so basically the protected areas cover 5.26 percent of the india's area 
uh, as 108 national parks and 564 wildlife sanctuaries notified under the Wildlife Protection Act 1972. And these protected areas are based on the fortress conservation model. For example, activities permitted in the reserve forest are not permitted in the national parks and the wildlife sanctuaries. Now, surrounding these particular protected areas, that is wildlife sanctuaries and national parks are the eco-sensitive zones, right? These, uh, these are about the 3.4% of the country's land and governments have notified 341 eco-sensitive zones in 29 states and 5 union territories while another 85 eco-sensitive zones are awaiting notification. Now together protected areas and ESZs that is the eco-sensitive zones cover 8.66% of the India's land area. Now what are ESZs? Basically, ESZ is intended to protect the protected areas, that is the national parks and the wildlife centuries. It creates a buffer between the, between the protected areas and the human civilization so that humans cannot interact with much of the protected areas. And this is the basic function of, function of the eco-sensitive zones. It acts as a transition zone between the protected areas and the human civilization. So the first objective of the eco-sensitive zones is very clear. It acts as a shock absorber, absorber by regulating and managing the activities around the protected areas. It is also serves as a transition zone between areas of higher protection and areas of lower protection. So these are basically the two objectives of the of creating the ESJs. Now, basically the MOEFCC, that is the Ministry of uh, um, environment and forest, forest and climate change basically notifies and regulates the eco-sensitive zones according to the Environmental Protection Act 1986. And the criteria is basically very simple. It designates ESZs on the basis of species that is endemism, rarity, etc. It also is done on the basis of the ecosystem that is sacred rules, frontier forests, etc. It also is done on the basis of geomorphological features, uninhabited islands, origins of rivers, etc. Right? What is the extent of the ESZs? Basically, an ESZ's distribution can vary in breadth and extent. For example, the extent of the ESZs for the boundary of a protected area ranges from 0 to 45.8 kilometers in the Pin Valley National Park, which is in Himachal Pradesh. Now, this particular trend is not followed across the country and the country it's basically the 10 kilometers range. Now, ESZs span notified forest outside protected areas, most of, most of which could also come under the Gram Sabha's jurisdictions under the Forest Rights Act. This poses a big problem and we will also understand the Forest Rights Act or uh, now the, this particular ESZ that is the eco-sensitive zones is not in sync with the Forest Rights Act as well as the PESA which is basically the provisions of the Panchayat's extension to scheduled areas X. How? Now the Forest Rights Act 2006 it talks about or it recognizes the customary and the traditional rights of both individual and collective of forest dwellers on the forest lands including inside the protected areas. Now this is significant protected areas local communities can manage traditional there is their right traditional right in order to manage the forest. Now under the FRA a new category of the forest called the community forest resource has been created and has to be managed by the Gram Sabhas. Now this is direct indirect contradiction to the but is under the ESZ, that is the eco-sensitive zones because the people are not allowed to get into the protected areas. They are not allowed any kind of activity and that is why it is in direct contradiction with the or these forest rights acts are in direct contradiction with the ESZs. And apart from it, similarly, the provisions of the Panchayat extension to the Scheduled Areas Act, that is PESA Act 1996, empowers Gram Sabhas to safeguard and preserve the community for resources on forest and revenue lands in the scheduled areas. However, Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change has shown no inclination to amend the in, uh, Indian Forest Act 1927, the Wildlife Protection Act and uh, Environmental Protection Act 1986 to comply with the PESA and FRA. This is the basic problem because communities think that this is their land. They need to protect it. They need to manage it. But 
the uh, the environment ministry does not change uh, make any changes in the forest wildlife protection act and the environmental protection act in order to safeguard their rights under the the rights of the communities under the fra as well as the peace act of 1996 right so these this is a basic contradiction and this has led, led to a case of kerala because western ghats cover 48% of the kerala and nearly 30% of the state is covered by the forest now if you are covered by the forest you will have more protected areas right you will have no national parks and wildlife sanctuaries and this is basically the case with the kerala now the eco sensitive zones in, in the state of kerala is very high now there is also a network of lakes canals and west wetlands as well as the 15 590 km long coastline all of which are governed by a set of environmental conservation laws now this leaves a little space for its 3.5 crore population which has a population density of 900 people square kilometer and most of the most of the population of the state of kerala lives near the forest and they have the direct interaction with the protected areas as well this becomes the big problem for the population and according to an sc directive at least 1 km from the boundary of every protected area in kerala should be marked as the esz but kerala state assembly recently unanimously passed a res a resolution urging the central government to exempt the state's human settlements farmlands and public institutions from the esz's scope right so this is the big problem with the state of kerala now what do we conclude from this we conclude that mining and other activities have long depleted the nation's natural resources we do agree with it but at the same time as a result the government's role should be not be limited to that of facilitator of the an economic activity it also must strive to achieve long term sustainable development but it should do long term sustainable development keeping in mind the interest of the people as well as the protected areas right this is important but in the state of kerala it has given the one size fit all approach which is very very i think unfortunate so now this is it regarding this particular newspaper article and this is it for the day thank you from my side do like and share the video and subscribe to this channel have a good day bye